We're really talking about two different types of screenplays here. There's the screenplay that gets bought, and then the screenplay that gets made. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff Schechter, man. How you doing, my friend? I'm great. So good to talk to you. Yeah, man. It's been We've been playing... Uh, Skype tag for quite some time, so I do appreciate I know, it. I know. Well, it's apparently between the two of us, you're the busy one. I'm, I'm sitting here like like this for months, going, "When's Alex gonna call?" Yes, I'm and sure like, that's I can't exactly. Talk to Schechter. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I've got a life. <laughs> Obviously, I've, I've, that's what I, I picture all my guests doing. No, I'm joking. Yeah. Um, no, but when uh, when we when we logged on to Skype, you know, we, we're like you know brothers from another mother because you've got all this amazing geek stuff in the background for people listening. Yeah. He's got Star Wars statues and Marvel statues everywhere, and and it's just it's it's nice. It's nice to see to see uh, that it, it, as well. So uh, before we get into it, for, how did you get into the business? Um, well, it, it, it was kind of one of those things where I always knew I wanted to be a writer. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, which was really, I mean, you know, I've got four adult kids and they asked me like, when did I know what I wanted to do? Because, you know, uh, they're they all in various phases of, they, some have figured out exactly what they want to do. Some haven't. And it's like, I, I don't know. It's like, I don't remember a time when I didn't want to be a writer and didn't want to write for television. And, um, you know, so it, it was sort of just like everything I did, um, starting even in junior high school, um, going into high school. And I was writing stuff. I was writing my own plays. I was directing them. I was making short movies, you know, with my friends in uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, and then ultimately came time to go to college. I uh, I just knew I was going to go to film school. I applied to, uh, you know, uh, to State University of New York College at Purchase, so SUNY Purchase. Mm-hmm. You know, where, you know, uh, had back then, that was late 70s, um, you know, there were the people who came out of purchase were people like Stanley Tucci and Ving Rhames, Wesley Snipes was there for a while, you know, in the acting world, uh, directing, I think, Hal Hartley uh, came out of uh, SUNY Purchase, uh, Charles Lane, uh, Park Posey was there. So, you know, so the, there was a sort of an up and coming kind of vibe to the school. And just went through film school there, got out, had a great mentor at school who helped get me into uh, into editing. And so I worked in editing for a couple of years in New York while still writing screenplays and then just moved to L.A. I read um, William Goldman's book, Adventures in the Screen Trade. Great book. Right. <laughs> it's a great book. It's uh, and he had anyway, he had a chapter, um, he, you know, the, the early parts of the book uh, before he started talking about his specific movies, the early parts of the book had chapters are broken up like. You know, producers, directors, actors, right? You know, and then there's a chapter that was called, you know, L.A. And the chapter begins, and I'm I'm paraphrasing imperfectly, but something like, I find Los Angeles to be a dangerous and potentially very harmful place in which to live. And I suggest that anyone seriously considering a career as a screenwriter move there as soon as possible. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, 23 or 24-year-old me reads that and like, okay. Um, where's my <laughs> ticket? Where's my ticket? Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, the, everything I had into a Buick Saber and drove cross country. <laughs> before I got before I got here, I've been here about twelve years, and and I lived on the East Coast as well. And friends here were like, the only thing you'll ever regret about moving to LA is you didn't do it sooner. Uh, yeah. And it's 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 true. Once I got here, I completely understood what he they it's were just, saying. It's an industry town, you know. It's like but the whole town was built. Uh, like I always say, you could take the film industry out of New York, and New York's still New York. You take the right. film industry out of L.A., I, 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 it's not it, – the, the whole infrastructure is built around the industry. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's like you want to go – if you want to go into, you know, auto manufacturing, you probably still have to go to Detroit, you know. Or, you know right. Or if you're – if you're, if you're, I mean, imagine if Silicon Valley left San Fran. <laughs> right. The whole, the whole, the whole town would just collapse on itself. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, that would be the time. Keep, keep your eye on that because that's the time to buy in Palo Alto. <laughs> yes, exactly. Buy as much as much real estate as you possibly <laughs> that's a can. Buyer's market, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> At that point of the game. At All right. So, point. so before we get into your your awesome book, I need to ask you a, a very serious question. Bloodsport two. Yes. Bloodsport two. The, the Citizen Kane of the Bloodsport franchise. Obvi- I mean, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I actually am not only a huge fan of Bloodsport 1 because 
I was I'm from the eighties. Though I'm yeah. sure if I watched it again right now, I would not think it was the best movie ever made at the time. Um, so it lives in my mind as what it was when I saw it. And when I saw that you wrote the sequel to that, because Bloodsport One was a it was fairly big hit uh, at the time. It was it was a it was a big hit. And then uh, you like, and then they call you up and go, watched, and they call it Van Dam. I mean, it was yeah. It's 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 one of those cult classics. I mean, I haven't watched it in, in you know, I don't know, twenty five years, years yeah, right. something like that. But it's it's definitely one of the. I mean, I still talk to the you know the the producer Mark DeSalle, mm-hmm. you know who uh, you know who produced the movie. Um, I don't think he directed it. He directed Kickboxer, but right. uh, no, somebody else directed uh, Bloodsport One. Anyway, and you know he's still like. Yeah, blood sport. Yeah, blood sports still paying the bills. You know? it's, it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. It's one of those things. And yeah. now, how, so then, how did you get the call? Because that, that's a that's a pretty big first. Because I saw it was like one of your first writing credits, right? That was that was, that was the first thing. That was the first like WGA. Got how'd you get that? Girls. How'd you get that? It's a crazy story. I had an agent at that time um, who, uh, well. I was studying karate. I was a black belt in Taekwondo mm-hmm. um, back then. And I guess technically I'm still a black belt, though. I can I could demonstrate one kick for you, but then you have to call 911 right afterwards. <laughs> yes. uh, in your gonna... mind, in your yeah. mind, you're a black belt yeah, still. Like, Ooh, wait, let me do it again. Yeah, that was a good one. Okay, <laughs> so um, so I was, I was a black belt, and I, um, <clears throat> I, was, um, I had just quit my uh my regular job i had a uh this was going this was 89 i want to say so maybe just going into 90 and i'd gotten out to la in 84 so i was out here six years and writing a bunch of scripts and got you know finally got a good agent and some good specs uh features and then um um i was working i was working like full time at something uh, I was managing the karate studio for a while, and then I was doing industrial videos, and you know, and then I was working for a sales uh, company. I was doing these industrial videos and 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 uh, sales training, and um and the guy that I worked for um had this he had all these interesting business theories that were actually yeah don't get no, no hate mail please, but it was actually stuff that was distilled down from L. Ron Hubbard, who had a lot of um. Uh, business theories besides his Scientology stuff, right? Mm. He, was, he was big to business organization. I mean, as you can tell, Obvi- from, obviously, because uh, Scientology is a very powerful organization yeah, financially. Right. Yeah, it's a super tightly run organization, right? So, anyways, but so so one of his principles that he had was that if you do something part time, you get part time results. If you want full time results, you should do it full time. So I've been, I felt that I had achieved. My, like as I was a successful part-time writer as I could possibly be, I had an agent. I was kind of optioning scripts for a dollar or ten dollars. I was able to go on meetings every once in a while, right? So I felt like for doing it part-time, I'm getting my part-time results. So, so I quit the job doing these industrial videos and decided to dedicate six months to nothing but writing. Um, so the yeah, I gave I gave them two weeks notice. The guy says, "Hey, look, uh, you know, we need some more time for release. You can give me a month." I said, "Yeah, sure, right." So that was like around Thanksgiving. So I give him the month, and in that first month, I write a script. I'm going, "This is amazing. I can, I can, I knew I could support myself for six months, you know, without having to find another full time job." I'm going to go, "Yeah, I'm going to support myself for uh, for six months, and uh, and you know, at this rate, I can write." A script a month, and it's going to be. I'm going to be a sure. big. That's the way it works. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, that's the way it works. Right. So, so wrote that first script in that first month. You know, had my last day at work, and then right around that same time, started getting involved in uh, Orthodox Judaism okay. <laughs> because I was I was conservative mm-hmm. Jewish, Jewish, but started mm-hmm. getting involved in Orthodox Judaism. I spent the next six months just learning about Judaism. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't write so anything. you were procrastinating as a writer. Oh, what a shocking, in, shocking. Religious procrastination mode. It was great. Divine so instead of Netflix, you went down the Orthodox Jew- Jewish route. Okay, fine. <laughs> At least I was able to say, yes, I'm procrastinating, but it's because God wants me to. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so the six months, you know, so five months goes by. I've now like almost completely depleted my my account. And I'm like, okay, this. I'm just going to have to go get another 
part-time job, right? Which I wasn't worried about. I was single, living on you know, my own. It was in the- it wasn't Ramen, I was, yeah, ramen noodles. I wasn't freaking out about yeah. it or anything. So anyway, so my grandmother at that time, did you want to tell the story? <laughs> I mean, you can get to blood sport whenever you want. <laughs> um, I'd always been- Okay, I'm going to get there. But it's just that you asked. So- <laughs> no problem. So- I hope you've learned your lesson about asking me any question. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Fair enough. I'm I'm seeing the pattern, sir. <laughs> okay, I, oh, I've, I've, lost, I've lost track of where we were. Okay, let me start again. Grandma. So, no. So anyway, so so yeah, grandma. So grandma, grandma had always threatened to, to take me on a trip. She was not well enough to travel. She says, "Okay, here's here's a you know small bucket of money. Why don't you go on a trip?" So I said, "Okay, I'll take a." Uh, I had friends in England, friends in Sweden. I go. Okay, so I'll go to. You know, England for a week, Sweden for a week, and then I'll go to Israel for two weeks, and then I'll come back, find a job, and, you know, keep pursuing this as a part-time thing. Do, I do my one week in England, and um, I literally am walking through the apartment door of my friends in Sweden when their phone is ringing, right? Now, this is pre-cell phone, pre-email, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So uh, their phone is ringing, and it's like, you know, I, I, you know I, I apologize in advance to your Swedish viewers, but, you know, you know, guten tag or whatever the hell they say in Sweden when they answer, they go, yeah, hold on one second. And they hand me the phone. They go, it's your agent. <laughs> what? Oh, they tracked agent you tracked down. down. You know, because I, I gave her my itinerary. She tracked me down and she said, she said, um, there's an open writing assignment for Bloodsport 2. Uh, the producer had read um, one of my spec screenplays, which was sort of a cop, you know, a cop action mm-hmm. kind of screenplay. Um, and, uh, and he would like to meet you, uh, to see if there's some, uh, fit for, uh, Bloodsport 2. I'm like, I'm just starting the second week of a one month trip. You know, will this job be available when I get back in three weeks? She said, no. I went, okay. So I, I said, I will come back in a couple of days. Right. So I, took literally whatever little money I had uh, left from the trip and whatever money I had in the bank and bought the only t- ticket I could from Sweden on short no- notice, which was a one-way business class ticket. At least you went in style. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, yeah, if we're going to go out, go out big. Uh, so uh, so uh, I got back to LA and met a couple of days later and just said, there's no way I'm not going to get this job. There's no way. I have to get this job. You know, it's like I've spent more than the money I actually even had. So I go to meet the guy and, um, you know, my, my Brooklyn accent is behaving itself well at the moment. But, uh, but the guy I met with, great guy named Mark DeSalle, he's from New Jersey. So, and he has not gone through the pains that I have to get rid of the accent. So I sit down in the office and goes, yeah, it's really nice to meet you. I'm going, hey, it's nice to meet you too. My accent starts coming out. And we're talking and we're joking and we just immediately hit it off. It was just like one of those things um, mm-hmm. where, you know, we just just really clicked. Right. And, you know, like, you know, two, two, you know, two guys from back east and mm-hmm. you know, some backgrounds and stuff. And so all throughout the meeting, he's going, yeah, this is great. I really love your script. But, you know, I got to, um, you know, I got to talk to some other writers. And, I, and I'm like leaning in. I go, no, there are no other writers. <laughs> and this happens like three or four times throughout the meeting. Yeah, no, no, this is fantastic. But yeah, I'm still talking to other writers. No, there are no other writers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and then, um, so the meeting finishes, I'm feeling really good about it. But then I race over to the karate studio that I was, you know, been training at because I had helped the, um, the instructor, the, the master at the studio write some karate books, you know, which is, I think also helped with the blood sport, obviously. And, and there was some picture in one of the books of like me doing this like 12 o'clock sidekick back when I could lift my leg over my head, mm-hmm. not by force. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I with a couple of guys of me. And I literally wrote in the gap between my bottom leg and my top leg, there are no other writers and ran it back to his office and left it for him with his assistant. That's amazing. And got the job the next day. That's awesome. That's an awesome it's just, story. Yeah, it was a combination of, you know. Serendipity. You know, yeah. Yes, yeah, serendipity, two boys from back east. But but I think the, the if I could um, presume to make a learning moment out of that incredibly long, potentially boring story, mm-hmm. it's that I was, I, I was just willing to do whatever it took 
to, to do it. I mean, literally like, oh, I got to buy a, you know, a $3,000 ticket with money I don't have to get back to L.A. No, if I, this, if this is what I want to do. This is what I got to do. Right. So it, it, it played it into this. Event that you got to be willing to commit. You got to, you know, a lot of people have, you know, dreams, you know, and, you know, and a lot of people have goals. And there's a difference between a dream and a goal. Right. So, you know, I had a it wasn't my dream to be a writer. I had a goal of being a writer. And this is what you have to do. That's what you have to do. You know, and you have to just suck it up and, you know, and put in take the risk and take the risk and take because it was a it was a risk. Like, you know, in general, it's a massive risk. You had no guarantee that you were going to do it. And you you were like, look, I'm going to lose the rest of my European vacation. And and then now I'm also going to have to spend three thousand dollars I don't have for the bear the risk. Also, it was a different time. Um, there was, right. it was a different time and, you know, I wouldn't do that today. Um, right. No, uh, right. And that's, and I was, I was, I was going to say that it's, it's not like I was there, <clears throat> you know, I was what, 28, 29, mm-hmm. you know, you know, single, you know, right. my monthly expenses were maybe $1,200 a month. You know, it's like, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't such a thing. Like now it's like, uh, if I was on a European vacation, a one month European vacation with my you know, with my wife and my kids and I get the phone call, you know, it's like, you know, I'm not saying, honey, you know, I'm going to go back to LA. You, you stay here. Yeah. I, you know. I mean, unless obviously, unless it's Kevin Fahey and then, yeah, th- right. Then it's, a, right. That's a much different situation. <laughs> I, also, I, did, I did on a, we were on a cruise, you know, uh, last summer mm-hmm. and, um, and there was a, uh, you know, a, a showrunner position had opened up on a uh, on a tv show and i had to talk to the show creator and you know and i it's, and it's a guy i knew i didn't get the job but like that's because like i'm in the middle of like you know the baltic sea or wherever the hell we were <laughs> trying to do a skype call with like international sure sure you know, sure Wi-Fi timing and, yeah, yeah. and like he couldn't hear me i couldn't hear him suffice it to say i didn't did get not the job. Get yeah. I did not get. I did not jump off the ship, swim to shore, and take a plane back for that. <laughs> no. It wasn't. Right, so let's get to your book because you know one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show was out of the in the screenwriting space of screenwriting books, yours definitely sticks out by its title. My story can beat up your story, and uh, it's a fairly <laughs> violent title, sir. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'm a man on the edge. Uh, you're obviously, sir. Obviously, all that karate is seeped into your screenwriting oh, God, from your blood sport days, just welling up. So, why did you write? Um, first of all, why did you call it that? And secondly, uh, why did you write this? What 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 caused you to write? Because there's a lot of screenwriters in Hollywood. There's a lot of people who uh-huh. worked in television. I mean, there's thousands of them, but very few actually decide to sit down and write about the craft or try to pat, pay it forward in mm-hmm. whatever they've learned along their their journey. Right. It's a uh, Great question. The, um, the the desire to write the book came from <clears throat> now I'm a bit of a gearhead, you know, like a, like a bit of a science, you know, not I don't want to say science background. I think that's that's giving myself too much credit, but it's certainly a huge interest as an amateur in science and physics and mm-hmm. and how things work. And you know, my favorite fondest memories when I was a kid was getting you know, some broken piece of electronics and, and attacking it with, you know, a screwdriver and just dismantling it and trying to understand how it works. So, so I've always was fascinated with how do stories work? Uh, just how do I reverse engineer a story? And I had a friend, um, a guy named Gil Evans, uh, who's also a writer, and he and I would have these conversations back and forth. You know, how about this? How about this? Oh, somebody has this theory. Oh, there's this Seven act structure. Oh, it's a six act structure. Oh, there's mm-hmm. 22 steps. Oh, there's the, you know, so we would just go back and forth and, um, you know, and try to figure out sort of um, the structure of stories. And I think the biggest aha moment I had was Bloodsport 2. All roads lead back to Bloodsport 2. <laughs> Obviously. That, that I said, okay, well, you know what? I want to, you know, when I'm going to structure Bloodsport 2, let me, let me take two movies, you know, get them from Blockbuster, put them in my, you know, handy dandy VHS player and just, just do like bullet points, you know, plot points, blah, 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 blah. So I, I did 48 hours and I did lethal weapon. Right. So I, I write it down. I wish I had those papers. It was kind of fascinating. So I wrote down blah, 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 plot points, 48 hours. And again, I had 44 plot points. I went, oh, that's interesting. Then I did lethal weapon, blah, 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 blah 44 plot points. So I went, whoa, 
that was interesting, right? They have 44 plot points. And then I said, well, can I subdivide those? Are there, was there a sort of a commonality on how those were laid out, mm-hmm. right? So I started saying, oh, well, the first section is kind of this, and the second is kind of a four-act structure with a dividing point. You know, so, so things started making themselves known to me, and then I would bounce it off uh, you know, my friend Gil, and he'd be like, oh, this is really interesting, because I just read this book called The Hero Within from Carol Pearson that talks about the archetypes that, uh, that go into storytelling, and, uh, and then I started examining films with these, uh, from the lens of these archetypes. It's like orphan, wanderer, warrior, and martyr. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it, and it laid out, you know, on those films. And then I started breaking down other movies and, you know, 43 plot points, 47 plot. It was all in and around 44. So I started thinking, geez, I'm really onto something here. So, so just for my own writing, for my own benefit, I just tried to codify it in some way and that that ultimately led to me um you know i was kind of dabbling in programming at the time and by program i just mean like a database programming Mm -hmm. which is Mm soft access and i said well let me see if i can create for myself a little template that i could use for story structure with microsoft access just on it for my own streamline my own process so i did it and we had this like you know the four archetypes and the 44 plot points and what's the nature of those first 12 plot points and the reversals that happen after the end of act one and the central mm-hmm. question that comes up and and just took everything that that, that i had learned um and uh you know, by myself and in conversation with uh, with my friend gill and developed this this kind of like interactive database that was sort of fill in the blanks and and you have a well-structured story because because the structure wasn't just working for lethal weapon and blood sport 2 and and uh you know and uh 48 hours it was working for star wars and it was working for you know i was writing uh you know uh, kids movies at the time it was working for dennis the menace too and mm-hmm. You know, and the Wizard of Oz, and you know, it just—it it seemed to just—you know—it it started feeling, you know, if I can, you know, in my spirit of self-aggrandizement, it started feeling like like I might have actually act, accidentally stumbled onto like the unified field theory of story structure. <laughs> okay. And, and so, so I developed this piece of software for my own use, and then uh, moved to Canada, going you know towards the end of the '90s, and uh, because of the whole immigration thing. I couldn't, um, I, uh, I couldn't work for the first nine months for Canadian companies. So I'm sitting around going, geez, what am I going to do? I had still had some contracts from the States. I was writing a picture for Universal. And I was like, well, what do I do with all my extra time while I'm waiting to qualify for Canadian work permits? Uh, I said, well, you know, I had the software. Let me figure out how to distribute it. Right. So, you know, so that became like my side project. I was going to market this story structure software. Um, but you know, it is any good piece of software, you know, uh, comes with an instruction manual. So I had to now write down the instructions for it, you know, which meant that I had to start explaining the theory behind the instructions. And so suddenly I had this instruction manual, which was like 50% of a book on screenwriting. So ultimately, you know, about 10 years later or so, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, I should just turn this into a book because everybody who got the software loved it. And everybody who was, would just even read the instruction manual would be like, wow, this is cool. You should make this into a book. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was kind of, it, it started from my own you know, lazy ass, you know, I don't want to think mm-hmm. too much when it comes time to work. Um, so I went from that to, you know, oh, well, here's a structure I can use for myself into, you know, something I could sell to others versus, and then it just they turned into a book as well. So then, so so now you have the story structure. You have this. You you've broke it. The unified uh, theory, uh, <laughs> the field yeah. of theory. Right? You you've gone to um, black matter uh, of story. <laughs> uh, essentially, um, I am I am also an amateur science geek as well. A little bit. Um, so it's uh, I, yeah. I I understand. Um, but so you started. I'm sure you've read a handful of screenplays in your day. Uh, so you've probably read a, a bunch. What are m- the most common mistakes you see in screenplays and, and specifically from first time writers, but also from even experienced writers, people, just writers in general, cause you know, like not everyone hits it out of the park every time. 
Yeah, for sure. No, no, nobody does. The um, the I think the the bi- biggest mistakes that huh, it's hard to say it in a way that's that's not that's not offensive. Um, be be offensive. It's okay. It, like, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, like it's a bad ear for dialogue, right? Or their ideas, you know, are not commercial, or you know, to be harsh, they just suck, mm. right? That that's not a mistake. That's just taste. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's not, it may not even be taste. It's just you know you just you've hit the wall on whatever your natural ability is. You know, mm-hmm. I, I you know if somebody if somebody said you know what's the biggest mistake you see with am- amateur mathematicians, <laughs> you know, and it, I, it'd be like, well, uh, you know, my inability to do high, any sort of high level math is not a mistake it's just it's a limitation right so so stuff that can't be learned you know you're kind of just stuck with so taking that out i would say oh bad characters or you know bad dialogue i mean everything can be improved but you know you have to cross that threshold into something unique and different but the 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 kind of the unifying mistake that i see a lot is bad structure um because part of what my study on the subject has shown me is that we are wired we have a biological imperative for storytelling and stories that are told in a way that our brains are physically constructed to understand um have a better have a deeper resonance to us than stories that come that try to you know, like, like if our brain has circular story receptors mm-hmm. and something's writing, you know, plot points that are squares, they're not going to get into our story receptors. And you, you, I mean, we've all had that experience. You see a movie or a TV show, and you go, I don't know, something about that really didn't sit right where I didn't like that. I'm not even sure I can even enunciate why I, I didn't like it. I could tell you why. It's because, because the structure, some, some aspect of the story um, it was trying to force its way into your brain and it blew everything up on the way in, you know, and then your brain starts trying to churn and understand what the hell was that all about? And, um, you know, and, uh, and it just leaves you with a very unsatisfying story experience. So the biggest mistake I see is, is, is people just don't understand structure well enough and structure doesn't have to mean formula. Right. I haven't done this exercise yet. I mean, I, I was crazy about the movie Parasite, um, but I, I can assure you that that if I sat down and, and, and ran it through, you know, my understanding of structure and uh, you know, the whole my story can be up your story approach mm-hmm. to telling, it'll it'll all fill it'll fall out in, in, in line. So and nobody can accuse, you know, Parasite of being like a formulaic movie. Mm. in any way so what structure does is it just it gives you a it gives you a a a wrapper around which you can let your creativity and your innovation and your uh your your personal flair for storytelling shine but you don't have to reinvent you don't reinvent structure every time you sit down to write a screenplay it's it's so it's it's I always use the analogy of 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 a house being built. It's the frame. So you you know houses are going to be houses. You can't build the foundation on top of the roof. It's that's just not you need. Exactly. There is a basis of how you build that house, and and it's always going to be the same no matter what you do. There's a foundation. There's walls. There's a door. There's a roof. Period. What you do inside of that is where the magic happens. That's where. The architect comes into play. That's where you could do mm-hmm. other things within it, but those basic building blocks cannot be adjusted because that's just the way the way it is. You can try yeah. to put the foundation on top of the roof. Let me know how that works out, um, <laughs> and then you get you know some some other movies that we will remain nameless uh, that, that 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 try to change yeah. the structure. And you're very right. Like you watch, um, you know, you, you watch a film like The Room. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and you you watch that, and obviously that that movie is so far beyond any sort of the the, the foundation is on top of the roof on a film like that, right. um, and also the dressings inside are all thrown around and everything, so it's upside down. But he's transcended; <laughs> he's walked into the the multiverse. He is now in another dimension and has now become right. entertaining on a completely different level 
exactly. for, for many people. And that's right. very rare. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's a, the, the analogy with the foundation and the roof and everything is, is a good, good analogy because even like in my book, <clears throat> you know, like going back to those 44 plot points, it's the first 12 make up act one. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that get really specific about you meet the, you know, hero, villain or stakes character, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very specific mm -hmm. flavor. After you get past those first 12, like the, you know, the remaining 32 are much more generalized, you know, it's like, you know, you know, seven pairs of yes, no reversals. And I don't say, you know, in this yes, no reversal, the, the stakes, excuse me, the stakes for the tertiary characters increased by 14%. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't drill into it because that that's mind numbing. Right. And, you know, and unhelpful, but the first 12 are super important. That's the foundation of the house. And then you, you know, and still we, even within that, you know, it, it's still gross. And I, and I should just add, you know, that, that the, uh, my approach to storytelling is not like, you know, cause as I would hear a lot, it's like, oh, so every, every movie has to, every movie, you know, uh, you know, it follows on page system. on page sixteen. This happens on page eighteen. That happens. Yeah, I don't actually. Yeah, I try not to get that specific, but it gets right. pretty specific, right? You know, so you know, so no, not there. There are a ton of really good movies out there that probably have nothing to do with my system at all. So my 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 and and this is I know this is you know, you know indie film hustle, mm -hmm. right? So you know indie films you know can be a little bit more freewheeling, you know, and experimental than what I'm talking about. You know, my goal had been to be a Hollywood hack from day one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so what I'm describing is a very specific, here's how commercial movies, Correct. Uh, you know, work. And the, the rea you know, it's sort of a chicken and egg type of thing. You know, am I saying that, you know, all, you know, all uh, good movies or all well-structured movies follow my system? No. You know, probably not, you know, um, do all movies that follow my system end up with good structures? hundred mm. percent. And then, then it's, you know, now you're stuck with your dialogue and your characters, characters and, your and theme you know? and plot and right. all that. At least, at least we took the, the biggest stumbling block off the table, which is structure. You know, the, the one, there was one movie I saw years ago and I, I haven't seen it since because it was so, I, I found it to be just absolutely horrible, which was, a, but it was a huge monster hit, which was Twilight, the original Twilight film. Um, when it came out, it was such a big hit. I just needed to go see it and I watched it and I found it to be horrendous. And I, because the, the main villain didn't show up until 20 minutes before the movie ended. Like <laughs> there was no even conversation about this guy until then. It was all about the love you know the back and forth pining and then i understand why i made so much money because the girls that went to go see it they wanted to do that and they, it, it right. fed into that demographic perfectly right. but the villain like the villain didn't show up as well. like literally 20 right. minutes to the end he showed up i'm like are you what, what, is am i the only one who sees this like there was uh, there was no antagonist for 80 percent of the movie so i couldn't relate to it so that just that rewiring thing that you were saying it was like short circuiting my mind was that and i just kept seeing like why does everyone like it and i'm like okay not everyone but you know yeah. why was it such well, a big right. hit that's right that was that's kind of like a there there's a two-part thing with that which is that the you know like when, when doing my analysis of movies um i never do sequels or movies derived from pre-existing material mm -hmm. because because you can't learn anything because they have such a built-in audience right? correct the and there was a twilight books yeah yeah, yeah, you know, you, you know, if 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 George Lucas, you know, released, though, I guess the Star Wars was original. Franchise. Yeah, is getting a little bit, you know, long in the tooth, you know, at least, you know, as far as critical success, but maybe not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, but but you know, if, if you know, if another Star Wars movie came out, you know, it's going to make a certain guaranteed amount of money, no matter how bad it is. And I mean, you know, it, it's just. It's got a built-in audience, so I, I find for educational purposes, you can, you you want to, you know, you can learn a lot more from analyzing Toy Story than you can from analyzing Toy Story Four, right? You know, which you can argue, uh, Toy Story Four may, have, for all I know, may maybe made more money than it Toy did. Story. It did. Yeah, 
So right. So I say, oh well, therefore, let me learn from Toy Story Four. No, it's it's got a thirty year built in audience, right? You know, right. it's like you, God, is it that long? Person. Jesus, it is. That I know. It's quite close much. to that. Ninety five, I think. Yeah, like so like twenty five years. Jesus. Yes. But, so it's like so you can't you can't learn anything from Toy Story Four. It's like, yeah. But while but Wally but Wally you can. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly correct, right? So something like that, right? Wally two, you wouldn't be able to learn as much from. I don't think it. Right? I wouldn't yeah. see Wally two, but but <laughs> yes, <laughs> I actually I would probably go see it. Wally two. The revenge. <laughs> yeah, Wally two, the electric boogaloo. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So anyway, so so a lot of the you know whenever I you know I, I would, that was like another you know big you know big uh, in, not innovation but big. Um, aha moment for me was looking at like, you know, I'd go through internet movie database and look at the top 50 grossing movies sure. of all time. And, but parse the list. So I took out sequels. I took out reboots. I took out anything that had any sort of brand awareness and said, now, you know, these, and those, those top 50 of all time might've been distilled from the top, like 300 movies of all time based on box office. Because I had to get down to the fifty original movies, you know, the, the Liar Liars and the you know the Star Wars, the original Star Wars. So let me ask you a question. So I, I always love asking about this because uh, Avatar, mm -hmm. um, Avatar was an original concept, uh, yeah. original world, no pre-existing, um, fairly risky film to to put out, and I argue still that there's only probably one man. On mm -hmm. the planet, who would have had that opportunity? I don't think right. they're giving Spielberg five hundred million to de design yeah. and, and do, even or Scorsese or or any of these guys. So there's very few, very very short list. But that movie obviously was the biggest movie of all time. Arguably, still is based on um, inflation and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you want to go back, Gone with the Wind, yeah, really the biggest one. Yeah, yeah. It's, wind, it, it's Snow White. It's Snow White. Yeah, and you know those kind of still did. But arguably speaking, it's one of the biggest. Sure. Uh, cultural hits of all time. Yeah, it was number one. Number one for many years. For, yeah, exactly. What was it about that story? Which I mean, it did get nominated for best screenplay um, and mm -hmm. best picture, but the screenwriting community, I remember, just destroyed it because it's uh -huh. Fern Gully, it's Dances with Wolves, <laughs> it's it's this and that. Like he, st they just go back, and I'm like, yeah, it is Fern Gully, and uh, yeah, it is Dances with Wolves. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it is Dances with Wolves. <laughs> But so, a much cooler version of Dances with Wolves. Right. Did you ever see? You ever see the analysis, the side by side analysis of Star Wars and Wizard of Oz? No, yeah, Star, I haven't. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Star Wars is Wizard of Oz. Well, it's, the, it's a hero's journey. It's basically yeah, it's, it's, right, exactly. It's so, the hero's yeah, yeah. journey. Well, my, just... my favorite it's is um my favorite my favorite is one of the biggest franchises in movie history, Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's just Point Break. <laughs> if you it it it's point break it's the literal story instead of surfers they're race car drivers right. it's i mean essentially the exact same story um right. it, anyone and anyone listening please go online yeah. and look it up point break yeah, yeah, yeah. is the original fast and furious <laughs> one, of my, one of my first agents uh you know infamously said this to me you know when i asked his advice about you know what should i what should i be writing he goes, I don't care. Just make it derivative and make it quick. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. So back to the original question, Avatar. What was about that film specifically that you feel, that story that that caught on? Or like what, what uh, going through your system, what is it? Yeah, I think it was, <clears throat> first of all, structurally perfect, character's journey perfect. You know, it hits, you know, undeserved misfortune, orphan, wanderer, warrior, martyr, you know, on a on a on a huge canvas, um, it it was a cultural event. You know, cultural event which you can't um, ever Quantify. predict. Yeah. Right. You know, look. You know, it's an imperfect analogy, but you know, you can talk about you know the abyss. Oh, you know, so I love the abyss. I love the abyss. Yeah, I I like the abyss a lot. You know, the character stuff, um, but. You know, same filmmaker. You know, um, took us to a, uh, took us to another world we've never seen before. Also, fantastical creatures, and didn't do a fraction of the business of uh, different time too, different time period. Yeah, different time. But you know, it was you know within five, six, seven years of 
of each other. No, you know, so it, no, it's not. That was in okay. nineteen. That was in nineteen ninety, and Avatar came out in like two thousand and something. But this was nineteen ninety. Yeah, because it was during my time at the video store. So yes, I remember when uh, it came out. <laughs> there's a short. There's a short window of time. 87 to 93 I'm pretty much unstoppable uh with uh, trivia <laughs> movie trivia that's that's my that's my sweet nice. spot I, I can knock it out there so what, so what, and what was avatar again Avat- avatar was if I'm not mistaken was either avatar. it was because it, um uh Titanic was 97. Or in ninety, yeah, it was ninety seven. Uh, Matrix was ninety nine. So Avatar was, I think, two thousand and seven. It was two thousand seven, about two thousand seven, two thousand eight, around there, or a little less. All right, hold on. All right. <laughs> while we're while we're speaking, continue speaking, and I'll look it up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So it was just it was it was just a you know it was such a complete journey into this fantastical world. And and part of it also was a, a little bit of a dog and pony show. You know, it's like we'd never seen, you know, creatures, you know, in that, you know, like that ever portrayed before, as well as they were. So right? the so, and, and it was uh, twenty. It was uh, two thousand nine. So it was okay. right. It was right there. So it's two thousand nine. So, but the thing was with with Avatar. Because a lot of people are like, oh, it's paint by numbers. It's you know, the story's rehashed. It's dances with wolves and all this kind of stuff. But the big thing that made that story go is that he, and I saw it when I was watching. It was like he hit every point perfectly. Oh, yeah. um, he execute. He basically made the perfect apple pie. Like yeah. it, it, like it's a recipe that we all know, but mm-hmm. he hit everything perfectly and right. then you add on the spectacle and the technology and the event exactly. and all that stuff and then it's an unbeatable combination yeah it doesn't uh, things don't have to be you know Complex. brand spanking new yeah it's not you know it ain't rocket science you know no you know what i mean it's like <clears throat> you know like you know yeah avatar was derivative nobody's ever 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 claimed that james cameron was the most brilliant uh, you know, a uh, dialogue writer, you know, in the world. He gets characters really well. He, you know, directs them, you know, uh, effectively. You know, uh, dialogue wise, Quentin Tarantino is better than James Cameron. Sure. <clears throat> but Cameron knows how to paint on a very big canvas. And, and, and he hits all the beats. It's, you know, he made it derivative and he made it quick. You know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, you, I'm sure you've seen the movie, The Big Short. Of course. I'd love yeah, that movie. It was, it was this great, uh, was it Gordon Ramsay? I'm trying to remember. It was, who was the chef? No, it was, uh, no, what was his name? He just died. Very sad. I forgot. Yeah. I, I, I think I remember. Who, I, I forgot who the chef is, but yeah, continue. Yeah. But anyway, but the, he's, he's explaining, you know, tranches of, you know, short selling, yeah. right? He says, you know, he goes, here's, you know, here's fish. You know, I bought it, you know, I bought it, you know, for the uh, the weekend crowd, but I have some left over. It didn't sell. So I can't sell it anymore as fresh fish, but I cut it up and I put it into the stew. And now it's a whole brand new thing, right? So, yeah, you know, so derivative storytelling, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm taking, I'm taking some old fish, but I'm putting it into a brand new stew. You know, and, it's, and it's, well, that's it but that's storytelling. But that's storytelling from the the epic of Gilgamesh. I mean, it's like well, that's the you know, whole you know, Lajos Egri. You know, there are only thirty six dramatic situations, right? So you go, okay, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, and I yeah. think and I think a lot of screenwriters and filmmakers in general, they all get caught up with like, I need to create the brand new thing. I got to create the new thing, and and I got to create something that's never been written before. And the thing is that everything's been written uh, in one way, shape, or form. All you could do is put a new twist on it or combine certain right. elements to make it fresh and new. And you look at even if you look at Pulp Fiction, which is arguably one of the more original mm-hmm. films uh, created in in the in recent history. Um, if you look at it and you put it up against the hero's journey and the points that that lays out, yeah, it all it hits. But he just what was brilliant about that is he just changed the the timeline, but the thing still hit, which is the yeah. genius behind that film. Like it's right. like it's it's yeah, beyond no, 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 my favorite examples from uh, from Pulp Fiction as far as like how does it follow the hero's journey is you know towards the end of. Uh, you know, Act Two. Mm-hmm. There's a there's you know the the death and resurrection you know moment. You know, you know death <laughs> of paper, 
Yeah, yeah, Uma. Yeah, Uma. No, no, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, that was part of it, but it's uh, Vincent Vega gets machine gunned. Right. Right. In the bathroom. That's right. So, right. And yeah. then the next scene, he's alive again because it's just, it, it was just that the timeline was, you know, was the, the conceit of the movie, it was playing with the timeline. And that was right? the brilliance, but that's the brilliance of that film. That's the brilliance of it. Right. That's what I'm saying. You, you know, it, you know, people who feel like, oh, I can't follow the structure, I'll make it formulaic. I go, yeah. It's because in, in your, formulaic hack you don't know how to do it better you know i'm, I'm yeah, it's, hence hence my story can be up your story you know I, i'm just a little too antagonistic with some of that stuff <laughs> i should i should be nicer so so you know, talking blake about snyder, you know blake snyder was a much nicer person than, yes than he, yes he, yes he was saving just, just, you know, it's like it's, just yeah, save the yeah, cat I mean, just save the cat don't beat yeah, up the story the just save the cat right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then and, and he was a, a sweet guy you know and, so, uh, so, uh, all right, so, so, so we're talking about structure, um, but uh, I found that a lot of times y you, I just saw a movie the other day that the hero, I, I couldn't identify with him. There wasn't anything really that really interesting about him. And I'm watching this cop drama and I'm just going, and he's a great actor and it's a, you know, and, and I love him and the cast is fantastic. Um, and the production value is great, what but hit, uh, 21 Bridges. The one with oh. um with uh, uh Chad Chadwick um yeah, Chad, yeah Chadwick yeah. um Black Panther and I'm watching it and I'm like it's just so bland like his character had no real depth there was no history to it he was just like this there was some I think that the screenwriter tried to do something there with his dad and like he's a cop mm -hmm. killer I mean he's a a killer of cop killers um yeah. as a cop and all this but it wasn't anything good um. What advice do you have for making, you know, for, for constructing a good hero? What are some tips? Well, it's, you gotta, you gotta go back to the sources. You gotta look at the hero's journey. You know, it's like, you know, there are a couple of, you know, a couple of like super handy kind of like. Swiss Army. Yeah. yeah. It's like Swiss Army knife kind of stuff. It's right. The Swiss Army knife. It's like, you know, I, you know, it's, I always ask these questions when I'm writing or, or trying to uh, sort of coach people with writing. So you start off simply, you go, what is your hero wrong about, you know, at the start of the movie that they're going to become right about, you know, at the end? Um, your hero's got to be the best at something, right? That's why, you know, you read it, you know, it's sadly like you read a lot of screenplays or stories, you know, written by people. And, you know, the hero's this like schlub, he's the loser, he's the joke at the office, he can't do anything right. You go, ah, it's... I get it. I know why you're trying to tell that story, but you know, it's you're short you're you're not giving the audience an in, you know, into the character. You know, you you know, if the guy's if the guy's such a loser, you know, he's not good at anything, you know, then you're not interested. You're, you're not interested. Yeah, what do you, what do you, what do you want him to accomplish, right? So it's like, you know, what you know, like so you know, and then and then you, you have to put the hero through the paces of the of, of the the journey you know you've got to you got to make it really clear you know by the end of act one you know what's your hero's um you know i i, I think it was sid field used to refer to it as like professional personal and private mm -hmm. right it's a professional goal right what's his personal goal what's his private goal right so lose you know professional goal is you know Starfighter. by the end of act one yeah, his no his professional goal is he wants to destroy the Death Star, right? Right. The personal goal is save the princess. Private goal is he wants to um, become a Jedi like his father, right? And and the way you can th and the way you think about that is when looking at your hero and your main character, you're saying the professional goal is what's the thing that means the most to the most people that your hero is involved in, right? Then the personal goal is goal is what's the thing that means the most to the hero and a couple of his or her closest you know associates mm -hmm. right allies or friends or family right and then the private goal is what's the thing that means the most to the hero right so it's it's so it's just sort of a holistic way of looking at your hero's full life and like going back to your very good question about like what are some of the big mistakes you see you say sometimes you know in a poorly told story the hero only has a professional goal Right. Or, you know, or the hero's not, you know, not, um, you know, gives up 
on the private goal too soon or the private goal becomes insignificant, right? Because that's how you know that's the other problem you know, that I often see a lot in movies is you, you, you've all seen it. You watch a movie and go, oh, the movie's over. And you go, oh, no, wait a minute. It's still going on. Oh, it's still going on, right? It's like you know, the, the people don't know when to finish telling the story. Your movie is over when you've taken that, you know, go back to Star Wars. You know, will Luke destroy the Death Star, save the princess, and become a Jedi like his father? When you answer each of those three questions, I know that's when your movie's over, right? So it's, it, you know, and then the whole, the whole film is dedicated to answering those questions, yes or no, you know? You know, it's like, uh, you know, he goes to Moss Eisley with Obi-Wan. So that's, yes, yes. By going to Moss Eisley, he will be, you know, he will be helping to destroy the Death Star. He will be hoping to save the princess. And he is taking a step closer to being a, uh, you know, a Jedi like his father. But they get stopped by stormtroopers. You know, so now it's all a no. And then it's a yes. And so that's why, you know, it's like, so then you start playing the reversals. But you've got to know the question. You know, you've got to know the question that's driving your hero. So, uh, did you uh, did you watch Office Space? Not much. The, the movie? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it a long time ago and then saw bits and pieces of it more recently. Okay. All right. Now I was going to wonder, I was going to have you uh, kind of break that that character, the, the main character, because he was a schlub. But then I was right. like, as, as we're talking, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, what, what is his professional goal? Well, his professional goal wanted to do this and his personal goal he wanted to get with Jennifer Aniston and his private goal was to do. So he's like, okay, you start thinking about Right. What it's but, you, know, what like, you know, but some movies, you know, you know, some movies just don't work. I mean, you know, like, you know, you can't break it down. Like the, I, I took the liberty while we were talking about Jennifer Aniston, uh, of looking up how much the movie grossed. Right. So the budget was $10 million and the movie grossed $10 million. Yeah. You know, so. But it, you know, but so it, but it, can, but it built into this massive following yeah. afterwards. True. But that's not the movie that that's the movie that Mike Judge could make. Yeah, because yeah. he was coming off of, you know, Beavis and Butthead, right? Yeah. That's not the movie that you necessarily could make. Oh, and that was also you, a different time. Also a different time. But you can't yeah. say it's a different time every time we talk about a movie that wasn't last week. Because it's a different time. Like, our entire industry <laughs> is so ridiculously different now. <laughs> it is ridiculously different because it's a different time. It's but, a different, obviously, it's a different time, sir. But, okay, right. but there, there, there are, we would be remiss if, if I didn't. Uh, if I didn't bring up this point, uh, which is that we're really talking about two different types of screenplays here. There's the screenplay that gets bought and then the screenplay that gets made. So, you know, anybody who is an aspiring writer has to focus on the screenplay that gets bought, right? Um, which is very different from the one that gets made. So the the corollary to that is there's the screenplay that doesn't get bought, but helps to launch your writing career, right? So if we, if you really want to get reductive about it, you know, most people, you know, like, you know, you've written the screenplay. What's your goal? Sell your screenplay or have a writing career, right? Probably having a writing career. Yeah. And selling the screenplay would be part of that, but it's not the exclusive part of it, right? So, so there's all sorts of radical ideas i mean i go into it in, in the book a, a, a bit in the whole you know the the smart writers business guide mm. uh where it's like if yeah you ideally you want to write a movie that that can get bought right so you got a, you know you got parts in there that you know it's like there's a there's a somebody can read it and feel oh there's a star that's this perfect for Brad Pitt, right? Or, you know, like you can, you can see it and you can throw it in the description. Hey, think Brad Pitt, you know, but this, the, uh, from Thelma and Louise days or, you know, what, however you want to specifically say, you know, who this person is. But then the, the other side of it is, um, you know, is you might also want to write something so outrageous and so unproducible. I know it's a weird thing to hear me who just described myself as a Hollywood hack, mm. you know, say that if you're trying to break in, write something wildly unproducible, but make it super memorable. I mean, I remember sitting with a producer and, um, and, uh, and we were talking ab about this right? because I think the meeting was over. I said, Hey, you know, I've just written the book. I'm interested in your thoughts on some of these things. And, uh, you know, and he said, yeah, you, you know, you write something unproducible. It goes, somebody gave me a script once about a dog who wanted to commit suicide, but his owners 
didn't understand that this dog was depressed and wanted to kill himself. So every time the dog tried to do something, like it was like, you know, you're like grabbing the toaster and trying to jump into the bathtub with it. The owners would be like, oh, boy, are you hungry? Let me get you some food. You know, like they. they it's brilliant. Really it, right? That's brilliant. It's brilliant. I promise you, if we have a conversation 20 years from now, and I hope we do because I'm enjoying speaking with you. Yes. So if we have a conversation 20 years from now and say, hey, what was that unproducible movie I told you about? You the dog who wanted to kill him. I can't make that movie. But you don't, you, you but it's, you you know, I never knew the name of the writer. I'm sure the producer, wherever he is, will, can still tell you the name of the writer, you know, or at least remembers the screenplay. So it, it makes you memorable. It helps launch your career. I'd love to find out who that was. Oh, my God. Should. I would so watch that movie. Can you imagine if it was a Pixar? <laughs> imagine if it was a Pixar animation. Oh, that would be joy. So, but yeah, yeah. So, so there, is, there is a certain aspect of the business about, you know, write something it's really, it's really, yeah, it's really a great, it's a really great idea of, of doing that. I've read, I've actually read scripts from screenwriters who then got deals because of it was basically a writing sample. Um, exactly. I, re I read, I read a script about, uh, it was a mashup between Alice in Wonderland and Sherlock Holmes. Uh -huh. Um, and it was just mashup. And I read the script. I'm like, this is completely right. unproducible, but it's very memorable, right. really good writing, tight. Um, right. An agent of mine gave it to me one day to read. I was like, oh, this is great. Like, we can't make, no one's going to make this. Um, and it was right before Sherlock Holmes got released and oh, okay. the TV show and all that stuff. So it was still a little early, but it's a little out there for the mainstream. But yeah. it's a great, it, but it's a great, um, it's but it's a, great, it's a great, it's a great uh, memorable piece. Now you do talk about one thing in your book that I wanted to bring up before we, before we go is what is the unity of opposites? Ah, the unity of opposites. I love the unity of opposites. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. Yes. It's this idea that it's, it's and I didn't even invent it. Um, I wish I did. Um, but it's this, it's this principle that, that characters are connected at some thematic level. And, and they, they represent opposite sides of a moral or thematic argument. So, you know, so it ties very cleanly into theme. I will go back to Star Wars, I guess. It's like if you imagine like a, you know, a wheel, right? And you put Luke as the hero in the center of the wheel, right? The villain is actually not Darth Vader in that piece. It's really, you know, uh, Peter Cushing's character, you know, because Vader works for him. So he's, he's the big bad guy, right? So, you know, and then you, you create these characters that go around Luke, right? So Luke and the villain, so the hero and the villain are connected on this thematic line. And for Star Wars, the theme is what's more powerful, faith or science, faith or technology, right? Because that's this whole thing. Shut off the targeting computer, Luke, right? He does and distract, right? So that's the theme, right? What's more powerful, faith or technology, right? Then you have the unity of opposites. So you have two, you know, so you have, you know, six characters circling Luke, right? You have at the top, you have Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, right? They're connected because they're both old Jedis. You know, they've trained together. They understand the power of the force, right? But they're opposites, right? One's the dark and one's the light. So, you know, and if you ask them what's more powerful, faith or technology, if you asked, uh, if you asked uh, Obi-Wan what's more powerful, he'd say faith. If you ask Darth, he'll say, well, faith's really important, but technology is what's keeping me alive. And, you know, the Death Star is this big ball of technology, not big ball of faith. And that's where he's currently working. Right. You know, so it's like so he's representing technology. So so Luke goes, oh, geez, I wonder what's more powerful, faith or technology. He taught, you know, he understands from Darth and he understands from Obi Wan. There are two perspectives. Right. Mm -hmm. Then on the other, you know, and then, you know, on this side of Luke, you have Princess Leia. And you have Han Solo. So these are young, you know, uh, self-actualized right. people, mm -hmm. right? So if you ask uh, Leia what's more powerful, faith or technology, she'd go with faith, right? Trust, you know, help us, Obi-Wan. You're our only hope, right? She has faith that, you know, that people will do the right thing. You ask Han Solo what's more powerful, faith or technology, he's going to say technology, you know, hokey religions are no match for a blaster kid, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Faith and technology. Then at the bottom, you've got the last two of your hero's main characters, and that's 
of C3PO and R2D2, right? Now, these, both of them are, you know, are big chunks of technology, right? But you ask uh, C3PO what's more important, you know, what's more powerful, faith or technology, he'll tell you technology, right? He has no faith, right? Versus R2D2, which, you know, is going on missions and, you know, he's got to help the princess, you know, he's, you know, he's the best friend character, right? So, so the unity of the opposite. So these, you have two robots, you know, are connected, they're, they're, it's the unity, but they're opposites. You have the two self-actualized young people, you know, older than Luke, but younger than Obi-Wan and Darth, you know, opposites, but, you know, there's a unity to them. And then you have Obi-Wan and Darth, opposites, but there's a unity to them. And it's all about the theme. So the thing, the, the thing I love, going back again to the question of, you know, what are the mistakes? I say, I say you know, in screenplays, the themes are muddy. You know, you don't know what's, what's your story really about. What's the argument? You know, that what's the thematic argument that the villain is making? What's the thematic question the hero is asking? What's the thematic synthesis? What, what does the hero learn about the theme by the end, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so Unity of Opposites is a cool way of, of identifying your characters, but also tying it to the theme, you know, which, which becomes super important. Um, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, um, what advice would okay. you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh, don't write a screenplay. <laughs> okay. No okay. Yeah. TV, TV, write a, an original pilot. Don't write a spec episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Don't write a spec episode of 911, right? Because you, yeah, you're never going to, you're never going to match what, um, you know, 911, you know, has, you know, can afford the best writers, you know, in, in the business and they all sit around together and they bounce ideas off each other and they distill out an idea. So you versus the entire room. writing of, right. yeah, the room at 911, you're never going to write a script even close, right? And if you do, they're never going to buy it. And, and if they, you know, if they really are somehow impressed, maybe you get a job there, but you're not going to get a job elsewhere because it's 911. So if you don't get your 911 job, you got nothing, right? You write an original pilot, one hour drama, right? You write a, an original pilot, it, they have nothing to compare it to. So already, you know, it's not like, well, it's not as good as our 911 script. You know, it's not as good as our original pilot, but it's still, it's an original pilot. If it's really good, people will pay attention to it. You might accidentally sell the damn thing, right? Because if it's any good, and it's a, that's a solid writing sample, right? You know, so it's, and there's so much, you know, so many more opportunities in television and, and, and it keeps growing. I mean, number of original movies that get made, I mean, here, so go to the Internet Movie Database right now, go to the homepage. Let's see, films in development, Thor. It's, uh, you know, sequel, Jurassic World 3, sequel, Fast and Furious 10, Reina and the Last Dragon. I don't know what that is. Oh, DreamWorks must be based on material. Animation. Bad Boys, uh, animation. Bad Boys 4, sequel, you know, pre-production, Doctor Strange, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, Last Duel is an original, uh, Shang-Chi, Legend of Something, Mission Impossible 7. You know, it's like, you know, in production, Minions, Suicide Squad, Batman, Matrix 4, Avatar 2. They're all... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, th this is all material you can never get your hands on. You can't get access to, but you come up with an original thing. Oh, well, my point was, you know, movies are going for big tent poles, and just the budgets have gotten so big. But TV, you can come up with something kind of new and interesting and and different. You know, and I've get had, in and get in. Have an have a fighting chance. Have a fighting and chance. And you can actually in TV writing, you you actually have a trajectory. You know, I can get in. I will start. Uh, you know, my my um my personal assistant on uh, my last TV show, uh, Stitchers, by name Matt Kane. Um, you know, he worked for a season as my personal assistant. He worked for two seasons as my personal assistant, uh, you know, produ production uh, producer's assistant. Second season, I said, hey, you know, you're a really good writer. Let's let's work on it. I'll, why don't you write a script with me? You know, so I got him script writing on the second season he worked with me. He just texted me last night that he's officially in development with Netflix on an original pilot that he wrote, right? That's a trajectory, right? You have a TV, it's a trajectory. Film, it's, it's a, it's a never-ending series of winning the lottery. 
right? That's a so, really great way of putting it. So TV, TV is such a better business. And to be candid, I think the best writing is on in television. It's not in films anymore, right? You know, you know, it's it's the people who know these things have said that if you didn't like whatever that Metacritic kind of algorithm that you have to look at to say, oh, here's a good TV show by by all objective standards. This is considered a quality television show mm. that there, there are so many of those shows that have crossed that threshold into being a quality show mm-hmm. that there are there are no longer for the first time in, in history. There's there there are no there aren't enough hours. If you did nothing, oh, and, nothing. including sleeping, eating and pooping. And you did nothing but watch quality television shows that have, uh, are uh, objectively considered quality. You couldn't watch them all, and more and more coming out every week. Oh no, right? it's so, impossible. So best yeah. writing, right, best writing is television. So you want to break into the business? Don't write screenplays. Write a one-hour drama, original, not a not a spec. You know, nine one one or Game of Thrones. Very yeah. very great advice. Uh, what is the lesson that oh. took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow, the lesson that took me the longest to learn um, is that I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm still learning that because I, I have a problem that I actually do think I know everything. Uh, we're, we're, I know, we are in the film business, so this does happen. I can't, I can't possibly <laughs> know everything, yet I still think I do. So, you know, I'm, so I'm still grappling with that. And I know I know, I don't know everything, and, and I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But, you know, but it it's I think to try to make it make me sound like less of a moron and you mm-hmm. know, more thoughtful about it. You create something brand new, right? You, a script, a pilot, whatever. Um, you have to be willing to believe, I think, that nobody understands it the way you do, right? And but you also have to be willing to think that people can help it. And the, the lesson is try to figure out where do I get the help that I need versus how much do I hold on to what I think it is. And it, it's, it, it's a particularly challenging bit of math uh, if you become a showrunner, right? Because as a showrunner, you know, you're responsible for everything. And I know we're talking about television again. But but the idea is that as soon as you start, you know, as soon as you start making changes that you don't agree with, right? Just based on you know, some, and some it's there's politics involved, it's studio notes, it's you know, notes from your partners. But as soon as you start making changes that you don't feel, right, then you become useless to the entire endeavor because you know you don't know you know if you, if you pitch me an idea for an episode of our show that we're working on mm-hmm. and I'm the showrunner about the suicide doc by about by a suicidal doc <laughs> exactly right right you know you pitch me an idea i can react instinctively and go yeah, i don't know that that's not sitting well with me you know wherever this pilot or this tv show came from that idea is not living in that same space i i could try to elucidate it or let's just reject it and come up with something else so that's me thinking i know everything and rejecting help of good ideas coming in. So you have to be able to figure, to kind of parse that calculation mm-hmm. is how much do you defend your material like it's your own child versus how much are you willing to look at it and go, yeah, my, my kid could use a little therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And you three know, of your- hard, fa- That's the hardest lesson, I think, for me personally. And three of your favorite films of all time. Yeah. Ooh, uh, they're, they're favorites for all sorts of different reasons. Star Wars. Because I saw it and said, oh, my God, you know, I was 17. It was like it was just such a complete journey and trip. It, that yeah. was pretty amazing. 2001, yep. you know, because I saw, I saw it in my teens and I was like, wow, that's, you know, film can tell a bizarre, is it linear, nonlinear? It's Kubrick. Like, it's just it's Kubrick. Kubrick. Right. You know, and, and then probably, you know, for historical reasons, Citizen Kane. Because it, it showed, you know, it showed what the, what you could do if, you know, if you didn't listen to anybody, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you just, you just ran with it. And, you know, then the, you know, the movie almost, you know, killed him. <laughs> yeah, very you know, much so. Very much so. But, 
it's Citizen Kane. So, so uh, some movies I like for like you know, like Leo, you know, like it because they really touched me. I mean, there's all sorts of movies, you know, gotcha. Gone, right? You know, yeah, like there's that. so many. Uh, all right, yeah. then where can people find you, your work, and uh, and your book or books? Uh, book, yeah, book uh, is on Amazon, okay. um, and uh, you know, my story can be a pure story. Um, I do have a, a, a poorly used website, um, you know, which is my story can be up your story dot com. But um, but if we have a moment or two, I'll make a plug for a brand new venture that I'm involved in that um, we're uh, I've started a company and we put out our first product called Writers Room Pro, which is uh, taking uh, ice cards, cork boards and the handwritten whiteboards mm -hmm. that are commonly used in every writer's room and saying this is nuts that this hasn't shifted over to a digital equivalent. I know why it hasn't because the price of the, the big monitors used to be too expensive. It's not anymore. So the time is now right for, for writer's rooms to, you know, like editing switched over from, you know, from film and trim mm -hmm. bins to Avid and, and cameras switched over from film cameras to, you know, to digital cameras. It's time for the writer's room to switch to a much more secure, much more robust solution. So that's the uh, the new venture. So it's uh, check it out at the writersroompro.com. And uh, it's it's really designed for pro professionals, but we have a lot of, uh, of ind individual writers who are using the whole system. And it's not a story system, right? It's not, we're not trying to teach you, here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Here's how you you know, plot out a television show. It's really, it's, it's just, if you could put it up on a board with index cards, but you wanted to make it searchable and you can output everything and import it into word and final draft. And stop it. And stop the madness. Stop, stop, stop the stop madness. Stop the madness. Right. <laughs> okay. so, so that's, that's the thing I'm kind of most excited about these days, you know, as, Great. as a clarity to my TV business. So writers room pro.com. I'll put that all in the show notes. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an hey, absolute pleasure talking to you. 